Now on to verbs. You have covered the nouns, we've looked at prepositions, we've looked at adjectives and pronouns, and now on to verbs. And as we begin in chapter 15, we will go in succession through chapters on verbs for several weeks, and these chapters will help you to put whole sentences together. You are ready to learn so much, and I want to pray and ask God's blessing as we look at the first of two screencast videos for chapter 15. Here I want to cover just an introduction to verbs and their value for studying Greek. Lord, help students to grasp the value of Greek verbs, to understand how they present time, how they present viewpoint in this perhaps new perspective uh, that students are not familiar with. Give them an ability to take in this information and begin to see its relevance. Ask in Christ's name, amen. When we think about the value of verbs, I want to note with you the way that they can provide a level of specificity that we may not be used to in English. Just the basics here, uh, and you can have mounts open in chapter 15 and looking at a few key ideas. First, the principle of agreement. Greek verbs agree with the subject of the verb, but we're aware as well that the Greek verb is kind of a self-contained unit, and every Greek verb has both the subject and the verbal action involved. That subject is embedded because Greek verbs have person, first, second, third, and singular or plural embedded in the ending of the word. Just as we saw with nouns, we have several letters here. It's the ending. It's what we stick on the end of a particular word that gives it its designation. With nouns, the case ending. If it's nominative, it's the subject. If it's the accusative, it's the direct object and so forth. And that ending signifies subject or direct object. Here with verbs, this ending is going to signify person and number. Now, we may have a subject, again, outside of the actual verb itself, but the subject is always embedded. So there is a sense that with Greek verbs, we can have meaning even without an external subject. Now, that external subject might help us to provide clarity and emphasis at times, but the subject is included in the verb. Uh, Greek verbs have this value of specificity again because we have two values, if you will, that come with every Greek verb. The first is time and the second is aspect. This one may be new to us and we'll look at that in a moment, but first just time. When we think about time, this is not really that novel here, past. Something happened in the past, and we have ed at the end of a word. Present means it's ongoing now, it's continuous. And future, it, it will happen at some future date. So we could think of arrows here, if, if you will. We have past going backward, present right now, and future at some future time. Then we think about the specificity of verbs and aspect. This concept of aspect is viewpoint. Uh, Greek verbs was with other verbs in other languages, but not so much English, have a way through the tense forms that are used to present information and the verbal action in a continuous format an undefined format or a stative format. And these correspond with particular tense forms. So the present and imperfect tense forms present information in a continuous viewpoint. They use ing often at the end of the word in communicating that in English. I am walking. 
the imperfect, a past time idea, but a continuous aspect. I was walking. Let me just uh, erase those and, and do that one more time for you. The present, a continuous idea. I am walking. The imperfect is past continuous. I was walking. Undefined, the aorist and future. Aorist is normally a past time idea. I walked. The future, I will walk. But both of those have an undefined aspect. That is, there is no continuous nature. We couldn't put an arrow by those. We would just say rather, they're a fixed stop. I walked at some point in the past, or I will walk at some point in the future, and it's just an undefined action. There's no specificity about that action in a continuous kind of nature. The final aspect that we have is a stative aspect, and that's the perfect tense form. And it combines this past kind of activity with the present moment and brings it in here. I have walked so that we bring in the past activity with the present moment. We'll unpack these further in the next few chapters, but for now, just understand the importance of aspect as viewpoint, and that viewpoint provides us with a, a perspective on the action. If it is an ongoing action, if it is undefined, it simply happened. Or if it's a state of action where there's something that happened in the past and that's being made relevant for the present moment. We think about voice and the specificity of Greek verbs and active. The subject actually accomplishes the action. The middle, there's a reflexive kind of an idea. So the, the subject does the action but there's often a view to him or herself. It's reflexive. It's looked like it's coming back. There's some kind of a self-interest. Or passive, the object receives the action. The subject here receives the action here in a passive verb. These are the basic ideas of Greek verbs and their value and the specificity that they offer.